Good day and today we're going to be looking at the coronavirus in the Bible and there's going to be a variety of you know perspectives when it comes to COVID-19 and the Christian story. How do we understand it? And there's going to be people on the open theist sort of end of spectrum uh, but also on the determinist end of the spectrum. Uh, so, you know, people over here would be saying, you know, perhaps God was taken off guard. He didn't really know what was happening because God doesn't know everything in an absolute sense. But over here, God purposed and planned it and has rubber stamped it and said, you know, this is going to happen for these reasons. So there's going to be a massive variety of Christian responses to the coronavirus. Um, when asked, where is God in this pandemic? One liberal Catholic, uh, Father James Martin, writes, the honest answer is, we don't know. But even non-Christians may find understanding in the life of Jesus. Uh, this view can be contrasted with the more deterministic sort of side from John Piper, who writes, he is sovereign over the coronavirus. Uh, one of the questions that sort of comes to all of our minds when we think about the coronavirus is, are we being judged for something? So from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, we're told that God does send plagues for judgment. OK, that's that's something that God does do. Or perhaps we should better say that God permits these things in order that we might take our eyes and um, our minds off the created order onto the uncreated things. Uh, in just want to turn to, to Habakkuk and if we look at Habakkuk uh, chapter 3 verses 3 through to 7 and we read this and I'm reading from the NLT. I see God moving across the deserts from Eden, the Holy One coming from Mount Paran. His brilliant splendour fills the heavens. The earth is filled with his praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from his hands. There an awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him. Plague follows close behind. When he stops, the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains, levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal one. So here we get this image of God coming up from the deserts out of Eden. But we're told that pestilence is marching before him. Plague follows close behind. So, you know, God is, you know, with these things. But that isn't the end of the story. Because if you go back to the, ver couple, the first couple of verses, it says, His brilliant splendour fills the heavens and the earth is filled with his praise. So the things that accompany him do so in order that the earth might be filled with his praise. OK, so God permits these things. He allows these things in order that the whole earth might rejoice. OK, so there is basically so that we can switch our eyes from created things, the things of this plane and really think about what really matters, the things that really matter in each of our lives, the eternal things, the, the questions that we don't want to ask ourselves because we're too taken up with material things and that we have perhaps forgotten. In Romans 1 at 25 we read, they traded the truth about God for a lie. They worshipped and served the things that God had created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. So here Paul is trying to contrast truth and lies, worshipping the things that God has created, the created order, whether it's money, sex, power or other created beings, you know, be they human or angelic, um, rather than the creator himself. Are we worshipping created things or the uncreated creator of all things who alone is worthy of eternal praise? Where are we finding our the location of our identity, the location of all of our um, source of everything that we do. Is it located within God and uncreated things or is it created things? Are we finding all of our identity in the things of this world rather than in Christ? OK, at Luke 13, 1 to 5, we read this. About that time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee and they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people in Galilee? Jesus asked. 
Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the Tower of Shalom fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No, I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. So here Jesus just taking a natural disaster. The Tower of Shalom had fallen down and killed some people. These are just things that happen. Um, and Jesus raises a question. Are these people worse sinners? And the answer is no. Just because someone con, um, you know, contracts coronavirus, does that make them a worse sinner? No, not at all. They're not worse than anyone else. OK, it's not God's judgment on them in a particular sense. Um, but rather, these things happen, and Jesus says, were there worse sinners in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish too. Jesus wants us to take our eyes off the physical act of judgment coming to the invisible act of our eternal destiny. Okay, so this is what's really important here, is that we take our eyes off the physical distractions of this life and focus on what really matters, which is our eternal destiny. Do we have someone, do we have Jesus Christ who has taken all of our sin from us? Have we been set free from sin, from death and from hell? OK, that's what really matters is that we're eternal beings who not in and of ourselves because God gives us life, um, but rather that what matters is what happens after death. Where am I going? What's going to happen? Am I still away from the source of light? That's the, you know, the Adam and Eve story is us cutting ourselves off from the source of life itself. And that's why they die when they're exiled out of Eden. They die because they've been cut off from the source of life. And do we have that life? Are we dying or are we connected to life, to Christ? as the source of our life and it's these are the sort of questions that we need to ask when things do happen when we perceive that these pandemics have happened or anything else we should natural disasters we should ask ourselves let us not likewise perish but let us think about are the eternal consequences of how we're living our lives what is the state of our souls today in Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, we read, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. So here we get a glimpse into God's plan from all of eternity to create for himself a family, sons and daughters in Christ. OK, that was his plan that he wanted for himself, a human family, you know, to join with his angelic family, that we would be one both in the seen and the unseen realms. But we would be one family united under the headship of Christ. And in Romans 5, 14, Paul writes, Now Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who is yet to come. And so here we get this understanding that Christ is the real human. Adam was just a copy of Christ. OK, and so in Revelation 13, 8, John can speak about the lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. So God's plan, even before the solar system was created, before the universe had come into existence, was to form for himself a family, a human family, through the death and the resurrection of the Messiah. And when we really think about that, it means that death is part of God's plan A, because the death of the Messiah was part of God's plan A. For him to create for himself a family through Jesus Christ. God wasn't taken off guard by the fall. He knew it would happen. And he permitted it to happen because he was creating for himself a family who could say yes to him. When offered the gospel, they would say, yes, we want you, Lord. We love you. We desire you. People who truly 
would say yes to him. And that's what God wants. He wants us to have hearts that say yes to him, freely given because of love. And so God's plan from before the world was to create for himself a family who would say yes to him, who just love him and say, yes, I receive all the gifts that are mine through Christ. And in Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 15, we read this. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who live their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. I, this is, these are some of my favourite passages in the Bible. We read, For only the Son took on flesh and blood, for only as a human could he die. The plan was that the Word would take for himself human flesh so that he could die, in order to liberate us who were held in bondage to a fear of death. And by this, the author of Hebrews is trying to say that all of us, when we're in Adam, in our natural selves, as humans, are enslaved to a fear of death. We're scared of dying and therefore so we, we find all of our identity in the things of this world. We need more money, more wealth, more power, just to satisfy all of our desires, sexual or otherwise, all of our, the loss of the heart and the pride of life, because we're scared of death. So we want to hoard up all that we can in this life. And we want to hold on to it and cling to it tightly. And therefore we're enslaved to the things of this world and the things of this life. But by dying, he destroyed death. He destroyed the fear of death that Satan had used to enslave us to the things of this world. So that we might be free to live a life of love for the sake of the other. I don't need to hoard all my wealth anymore. I can give it away. I don't need to satisfy all of my lusts because I know that all of my deepest longings are satisfied in Christ. It's, you know, we can now live our lives in, as love for the other rather than hoard everything for ourselves because death has been overthrown. Only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. It was God's plan all along to liberate us through the death and resur resurrection of the Messiah, to be free to live a life of love for the other. And the coronavirus reminds us of these truths. It makes death visible to all of us when before we liked it to be locked away behind closed doors in hospitals or care homes where we couldn't see it anymore. But now it is fully visible and we can be reminded to take our eyes off the things of this world onto heavenly realities. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 39, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Uh, John Bear talks about uh, Ignatius of Antioch, a disciple and friend of John, who wrote the Gospel and Revelation. Um, on his way to the churches in Rome, about to be killed, he, he wrote to the churches in Rome, sorry, on his way to be killed, around 107 AD. And he writes this, and this is eye-opening from a, a Christian who, who knew John and was inspired by John. He says, the, the time of my birth is close at hand. Forgive me, my brothers. Do not stand in the way of my birth to real life. Do not wish me stillborn. My desire is to belong to God. Do not then hand me back to the world. Do not try to tempt me with material things. Let me attain pure light. Only on my arrival there can I be fully a human being. So by his birth, he means his death. For Christians, death is a birth into new life. The ground in which we're buried is not just a tomb, it's also a womb to new life. And Ignatius writes, only on my arrival there 
can I be fully a human being? So here, Ignatius isn't defining a human being like we do, like Adam, like the copy, but with the reality, which is Christ, someone who's died and risen again. So that's what a human being looks like, some, someone who's died and risen again. And that's why, you know, through the sacrament of baptism, we picture that in our own lives. So we've now died to the things of this world and then we've risen again to be united to Christ and to his life and receive that life into the world. Um, he's saying a human is one who looks like the new Adam, like Christ. The one who was planned for before the foundations of the world was laid. Adam was the copy, Christ is the reality. To die as a Christian, therefore, is to become fully human. And coronavirus awakens us to that fact, to that reality. One of the other questions that comes with the coronavirus is, do we obey God rather than a human authority like Acts 5, 29? Or as Romans 13, 1 and 2 says, everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. And I think the question comes into what is the greatest commandments? Love God with our, all of our hearts, minds and souls and love our neighbours as ourselves. OK. And so when it comes to protecting our neighbour, it means we wear a mask because we don't want to be the bearers of death to those people by carrying a virus that we might not know we have to them. We wear masks not to protect ourselves, but in order that we might love our neighbour. And that's important. We love our neighbour. And that's obeying the greatest, the second of the greatest commandments, OK? That we wear masks up in order to love our neighbour. And that doesn't mean that we hide behind closed doors or anything else, but it means that we live our lives in love. To reflect Christ's life into the world. I hope this has been helpful and that you tune in again for more talks. Thank you.